regard to, to you, so, so, so you see us now, we're heavily involved in regard to uh, the checkpoint inhibitors, anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1, anti-TLA-4, uh, but also an important perspective in liver cancer still is the uh, etiology, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, NASH, alcohol. Uh, our perspective would like to hear from you, forget about the checkpoint inhibitors for a second, but uh, just for you how, do you, how do you see, is a patient with hepatitis B-related HCC a different from hep C, or how, how do you read them? Well, definitely, definitely um, these are different patients, and uh, um, clearly uh, it's important to point out that there's been a, a major advancement even in the management of the uh, viral hepatitis itself. Um, until recently, for FC, um, this was, you know, a very difficult disease to treat, and clearly with the introduction of uh, uh, direct antiviral agents, uh, now most patients can achieve a sustained viral response. So clearly, opening, uh, opening, uh, you know, new prospects for 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 their life, and uh, um, in a way, changing uh, the prognosis uh, uh, significantly. Uh, of course, these patients remain at risk for the development of a tumor, um, and this is why it's important to maintain uh, um, surveillance in place and trying to diagnose as much as we can tumors early in all these patients subset. Then there may be specific considerations when it comes to decide the treatment strategy for each uh, of these categories. Fair, fair. I hear you very clearly. And uh, we'll take the other view. So, uh, Mike, in your clinic, like a uh, patient with Hep B related HCC versus Hep C related HCC, are they the same, different disease? How do you read them? Uh, and especially, I will add here, and especially from the perspective of the checkpoint inhibitors, like. Well, fortunately, we found that the checkpoint inhibitors work fine, and, and even better, we don't see flares of the underlying disease or damage to the liver uh, based on an immune attack on the, on the hepatitis. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm sitting next to a hepatologist and saying, well, they're all the same, but uh, <laughs> the medical oncologist, uh, the main issue is that hepatitis B patients sometimes do present with much larger tumors, but they don't always have cirrhosis, whereas the hep C patients by and large do. And, uh, sometimes have more chronic uh, liver disease that we have to deal with simultaneously. No, I hear you very clear. And by the way, there are two theories on this still, uh, you know, we at Sloan Catering, we're working on this, is uh, are they really different diseases or they can really kind of, you know, come to the final uh, and uh, end of the line, same story, because at checkpoint tumors, as you mentioned, uh, really it, it seems it doesn't matter. But uh, let's take a little bit of a transplant perspective. Uh, checkpoint inhibitors uh, from like uh, the uh, uh, transplant perspective, uh, do you think, number one, uh, is there anything that this suppressive immunity in the transplant patient that really will might trigger things differently or how does it work? And will, will we be concerned about that? Yeah. There, we, we are quite concerned about using uh, the checkpoint inhibitors in transplant. And as you know, we need to immune suppress patients so that they don't reject their, their allografts. And that's regardless of what kind of transplant. It's, you know, kidney transplant, liver, heart, lung, et cetera. Um, there have been reports of using checkpoint inhibitors after transplant for various diseases, HCC, but also things like melanoma. Um, and there are patients that will lose their graft. And when you look across all of the organs, it, the risk of graft loss really is different depending on which transplant. The liver is a little bit more of a tolerant organ, um, again, because of that chimeric immune system that we, have, that we see. But it, it seems that there's somewhere around a 35 to 40 percent mm -hmm. risk of graft loss with immune checkpoint inhibitors after yeah, transplant. Yeah. With a kidney, okay, they go on dialysis. With a liver, you really can get into big trouble. And there's been reports of very severe rejections that have not been able to be reversed. Yeah. So that's something that patients have to be aware of if we choose to use those. Sure. Interestingly, there's also been um, some, some data looking at di biopsying the allograft and staining for PD-1 in the allograft rather than the tumor to try to predict whether that patient has a higher or lower risk of rejection. And the patients that, that do have PD-1 staining in the allograft may actually have a higher risk of rejection with the immune checkpoint inhibitor. So that's, that's something we need a little bit more sure. data for. Actually, you bring you another important point, and I'll go back to Tim. So uh, uh, interestingly, in... Uh, Almost most cancers, we look at the, you know, PD-1 expression, 
And the NACC, it seems like we don't do much. And uh, you already suggested that a little bit. Again, tell us what's the connectivity between an NTCTLA4 and then NTPD1 and NTPDL1 that kind of, you know, might make things look differently for HCC compared to other tumors? Well, you know, that's a difficult question. So, so you know, the initial studies in, in HCC were actually done with CTLA4 just because, yeah. like in any other disease, we started with CTLA4 in melanoma also. And in those studies, we noticed that um, um, one of the major mechanisms that CTLA-4 really has is that it actually brings T cells at the side of the tumor. Yeah. Tumors usually are not very heavily infiltrated by T cells, although we know from many old studies that the higher the infiltration rate with the cytotoxic T cells, the better the spontaneous outcome is actually for patients. So what we usually find more with CTLA-4 is an influx and an acute inflama uh, inflammation in the tumor, whereas with the PD-1, we see more sustained response. And, and that's why um, currently there are a number of ongoing studies where those two drugs are actually being um, combined. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, along that same line, if anything, uh, uh, we're hearing about a lot of combinations. Another combination that I'd like to ask Mike about is, uh, what's the story with uh, combining an anti-PD-1 and a anti-angiogenic, uh, anti-VGF or a TKI? Well, uh, you can think about this in, in two ways. One is the very simplistic view of they both have efficacy, and you could certainly expect additive effects, but what we're really hoping is synergistic effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of ways this could occur. Uh, one that uh, actually I've, I've uh, studied a number of years ago was uh, the fact that uh, VEGF seems to cause, among other things, uh, uh, defects in dendritic cell maturation, increases in myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So just inhibiting VEGF in that environment or the signaling of VEGF is likely to give uh, more mature dendritic cells, uh, ultimately leading to fewer regulatory T cells in the environment and uh, less myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So there's really a, an immune effect from the uh, anti-angiogenic therapy. Also, we know that there's some changes in the vascularity. Some people would say pseudo-normalization, but some changes that might actually allow uh, better immune cell trafficking, and uh, there's also changes in interstitial pressure within the tumor, which also may allow uh, better distribution of uh, the influx of immune cells. So I think there's a real synergy, and clearly preclinical trials, and now early clinical trials have demonstrated that. Well, but, but, you know, if anything, we're hearing quite a bit of information so far, so it kind of like to resummarize what we just heard. Number one, uh, understandably, uh, the perception that we all had in regard to the immune system and the liver is not as simple as we might have thought it is. It's rather pretty complex. And uh, no doubt that as we are hearing uh, from uh, many of the uh, colleagues that uh, the interaction between an NTPD1 or NTPDL1 with the tumor cell in HCC is not necessarily appears to be sufficient. And in other words, an NTCTLA4 kind of, you know, interaction probably is necessary uh, because of the buildup of the immune system in the liver cells per se. And this is really interestingly what uh, Tim just kind of suggested in regard to the um, uh, staining uh, because Understandably, we don't necessarily need to stain for a PD-1 expression in the tumor cells. And this tells us in HCC that the whole mechanism of how the checkpoint tumors will work is not necessarily the same as we are seeing it in regard to, uh, uh, in regard to other solid tumors. Now, at the end, uh, also, uh, Mike brought up a very intriguing, and I'm sure we are all intrigued by the idea of a combination of a, a checkpoint inhibitors plus an anti-angiogenic. And uh, he's right. If anything, uh, we would like to see some potential synergistic effect. There's a lot of activity in that regard. We're going to talk about it a little bit later in the program. Um, but for now, uh, the understanding is that, yes, uh, there could be through the cycle of the immune cells a certain interaction at the VGF level that actually will trigger it further to kind of, you know, um, uh, activate, uh, deactivate itself and as such, uh, you know, inhibiting the VGF will probably make sense. However, uh, of course, this all will be shown in the data to carry on.